Welcome to Music Business Hacks. Today we're speaking with singer, songwriter, guitarist Frankie Ray, an artist who's been making waves in the greater Tampa Bay area. In addition to taking the stage at over 100 venues across the state of Florida, she's also performed at the NAMM show in Anaheim, the 2018 Key Largo Regional Music Festival, and she's been doing shows with the Major League Baseball team, the Tampa Bay Rays. Today we speak about her booking strategy of packing her month full of events, sometimes two or three shows per day. We also go into the mindset of an artist and talk about specific resources that you can use to help your career thrive. So without further ado, let's listen to this talk with Frankie Ray on today's episode of Music Business Hacks. Uh, Frankie, welcome to the Music Business Hacks podcast. Hi. Hi. So one of the things that I'm really looking forward to speaking with you about is your super crazy booking calendar. <laughs> you have yes. a lot of events going on, and one of the things that I really love, and it's a tactic I definitely used in my own particular music career was that you don't just limit yourself to booking regular clubs or acoustic listening houses or anything like that. You have a great variety of venues and events. So when I go to your website, I go to your live show section and it looks like you're playing almost every single day and oftentimes multiple times a day. So I would love to speak with you a bit more about this and how you've approached performing live. So first off, do you book all of your own gigs? Um, for the most part, I do. I have a, um, a couple agencies that I work with that every now and then when they have a bigger event that they need someone for, they'll give me a call. Um, but for the most part, I, I definitely do my own booking. And I, I definitely, diversity is a big thing to me. So I, I try to not just play at, like you said, listening rooms and coffee shops and lounges, but I also try to branch out to different types of festivals, um, restaurants, basically any place that has music, even if it's a one-time thing or a multiple booking. And what's your approach when you start looking at different venues? Do you Are you just looking for anyone that has a stage and PA system that wants to hear live music? Or do you look at who's attending those kinds of spaces? Like, how do you kind of figure out what a place is and if it's going to be a good fit for you or not? Um, I look at all different aspects of the venue. In the beginning, I really was just looking for any place that had a stage and a sound system. Um, I think because I do play so much now, I've definitely learned to kind of be, I guess, a little bit more picky with my venues. Um, just because I've learned my style and my sound, I've learned, you know, what places I fit in and what places I don't fit in. But when I am looking to book shows, um, I do go to a few different websites besides social media sites. Um, I go to go tonight. That's actually a really useful tool because it's kind of like a social media site just for places that have music. So what they do is they go on this website and they'll list their concert schedule. So what I usually do is I'll go onto that website and look at what venues are posting things. I also look at the types of artists that are playing there. If they kind of sound similar to me, then I know that that's a spot where I'll definitely fit in and that's a place that I should check out. However, if it's just heavy metal bands, you know, I know that I'm not probably going to get that booking and I know that I probably don't really want to get that booking because it's just not, it doesn't really fit my style, you know, and it wouldn't really be helping anyone out to play there. Sure. So go tonight.com is the website mm -hmm. and you're using yes. it to kind of look for things that are coming up and sometimes even last minute gigs as well. Yeah, absolutely. And um, local newspapers, Creative Loafing is a really big one in Tampa. Um, there's also basically any little town that I play in has some sort of newspaper slash magazine that's dedicated just to entertainment around the area. Um, I am very fortunate to be living in Florida where there's a lot. I mean, tourism is a huge thing in this state. So luckily, you know, that there's there's always different ways that I can find where entertainment's going on because Florida is all about their entertainment because we have a lot of tourists, you know. Yeah. And the same thing goes for a lot of acts who are on the road. If you're hitting up markets even outside of your own hometown, if it happens to be a place that high has high levels of tourism, there are a lot more opportunities out there than simply the venues and uh, booking database like India on the Move because 
there's always something going on. And a exactly. lot of times you could find shows at, at theme parks or uh, restaurants who, who want to cater to those audiences who want something different and exciting. Yeah, exactly. And so when you're approaching these venues, whether you're using gotonight.com or you're picking up your alt weekly and reaching out to a venue, do you have a particular strategy or process in contacting the venues? Like how do you pitch your music when you're trying to get a show? The first thing I do is I research the venue. I go to their website. Usually what venues will have or restaurants or whatever, they'll have a spot on their website that says, oh, if you're interested in playing here, click this link. So that's the first place I go. I make sure that I'm doing my research on the venue. Um, I run into a lot of places that don't even have a website. So then I go to their social media. I see how active they are. And kind of the last resort is just to send a Facebook message, you know, and a lot of, I get a lot of bookings through Facebook messages, as funny as it sounds. So um, that's one thing that I do. And then once I get all of my research down and I see, you know, who's the manager, how are they booking? Is there a spot on their website? Um, then when I do reach out to them, the first thing I send them is my press kit, which is probably one of the most important booking tools that a musician can have, <laughs> I think. So I send over my press kit, which has all of my information. Um, and I keep it, I keep the email short and to the point. I don't include my biography in the email because that's what the press kit's for. You know, they're not going to want to sit there and read this long drawn out email, you know, so um, I, I just, I say, hi, my name is Frankie Ray. I'm a local musician. I see you have live music. I'd, you know, love to come play for you and, and be a part of your team, you know? Yeah. No, I think that's a great idea because I think what happens with a lot of artists who are starting out is they put their entire life story into the email. But the mm -hmm. reality is the venue doesn't care when you picked up the guitar or who joined your band or what acts you played in if they weren't national acts or at least local ones or they're really strong following that yeah. your, your email is the teaser. It's like the movie trailer. You want to just give them enough to want to click on that link. Yeah, exactly. Now, exactly. Do, you, do you use a particular website for uh, a press kit like Sonic Bids or Reverb Nation? Or I actually use, um, so for my website, I go through Bandzoogle and they actually have a tool on their little site builder um, where you can actually make your own electronic press kit and they they set it all up they give you a spot where you put your image a spot where you put a quote um they allow a, s a space for more pictures and videos and music um and then at the very bottom of my press kit i added another text block with basically just a quick resume guide with all of the the bigger festivals that i've done and radio shows and tv stuff so very yeah, cool. that's that's how I get it all together. <laughs> so one of the other things that I notice about your schedule is you do a lot of local and regional shows. How do you how do you work with this in a way that doesn't oversaturate your market? Like you know, for for venues who might not necessarily want to see the, the an artist play the same town super frequently because they they're afraid it might impact their draw. Like, do you have a yeah. way of addressing those kinds of concerns? That's actually a, a big deal that a lot of musicians don't pay attention to. Um, so the reason I play in so many different cities is to avoid oversaturating myself in one area because, you know, that if, if people are coming to see you at one location, but they know tomorrow night you're going to be right down the street, it's really, it's, it's almost like it's not fair to both of those venues. Cause if there's people coming out to see you to the first show, well, then they're like, well, I just saw her, you know, last night. So, um, I, I, first of all, I, I ask the managers where I'm playing. There's one area where I play. Um, and the manager actually asked me, he said, well, why don't you play down the street over there? And it was the man, the booking manager is asking me this. And I said, Oh, well, I don't want to oversaturate. I was like, well, I don't want to oversaturate myself. And he's like, Oh no, all the musicians in this town do it. He said, this is a tourist town. So, um, we're less concerned with that. So some areas, some markets don't actually care if you're playing every night on the same street because they have so many, especially during season when you have all the snowbirds down here during the winter, um, well, Florida winter. So <laughs> they're, um, you know, that their business is going to pick up anyway, just because of tourism and because it's busy season. So those places are usually less concerned with oversaturation. 
Because they're not relying on the artists to draw quite as much. They they just know people are going to be there. They just need entertainment. And that's the thing with restaurants. That's kind of pretty much all restaurants are like that. Venues are a little bit different for exclusive shows. So sure. I definitely avoid oversaturating myself in those types of markets. And I think it's important here for artists to realize that when you start approaching booking, it's to look at that particular strategy. Like, what is that market that you're playing into? Is it a market where venues are dependent on artists to provide the draw? Or are they simply providing a stage and they need some entertainment? So that's going to be a very different approach in terms of what the goals of the venue and what the goals of a restaurant or coffee house are going to be. Because like you mentioned, some people care more than others. So if you're yeah. on the road, this is actually advantageous because it might provide some additional opportunities that you might not re realize. And if it's domestic, then you might be able to find a way to create a residency or look for other opportunities in your own hometown in ways that don't not only just avoid like making people feel uncomfortable, but maybe even do it in a way that builds up relationships in a way that's really productive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is just doing your research. You know, you really need to, to look what types of people are coming to this. Now, like I said, it's, it's so different. You know, restaurants and venues are, you know, two different things. So they definitely take two different approaches. But I do think it's it's a lot easier to book the restaurants because you have to think about less. You know, they they like said they don't in busy tourist areas, they don't really care as much about if you're playing down the street the next night, whereas more exclusive places, they do care. In smaller towns, they do care. So you really need to make sure you're doing your research. Definitely. And one of the things that I also notice is that you like to stack your, your days. Like if you look at a typical weekend on your website, you have two or three shows a day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So what is your approach to this? Why did you why did you decide to do it? Like do you, do you enjoy it because you want more revenue because you're ex you know getting more exposure? Uh, does it exhaust you? <laughs> like you know tell tell us a bit more about this. This it's it's half of me wanting to just do as much as I can and then half of me just being a workaholic. <laughs> um it it I guess there's not enough days in a week, you know? You have a lot of places that only do music on the weekends, and when they contact me, like, like I, a lot of times, you know, I'm at a point now where a lot of these restaurants are contacting me. You know, I'm not really reaching out to them as much. Um, but basically, if I can make it work, I make it work. I really don't have any, you know, profound words of wisdom about, you know, the benefits of doing multiple shows in a day. Um, if I can make it work, I make it work. You know, I mean, I'll have um, like this past Sunday, I had three in a day. I had the Rays game in the morning, the Tampa Bay Rays. It's a major league baseball team in our area. And I I played there in the morning. And there was also another uh, restaurant that I wanted to book that day. Um, and I said, oh, well, the Rays game is done at one and I don't have to play to this place until like 2.30. So that'll work. I can make that drive. And then um, a few days before the shows, a friend of mine at a restaurant texted me and she said, hey, you know, our music canceled for Sunday night. Can you please cover? We really need someone. And yeah, like I said, if I can make it work, I make it work. So I said, yeah, I'll I'll head down there after my second show. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, yeah. It sounds very familiar to me because uh, on many of my tours, I'll oftentimes stack it with two and i think the most i ever played in one show was five shows but uh my wow. band my, my band wanted to kill me at then so i decided not oh to do gosh. that anymore <laughs> yeah see and i i try to avoid the, the the triples because i used to do them a lot and i i definitely realized it started just wearing down my body and especially my voice too i think Sometimes, I mean, I'm, I'm bad with this. I, I forget the health side of all of this. So if I'm singing all day and, you know, and if I'm doing it all the time, that's really not good for my voice, which is my main thing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So when you do, when your voice is really tired after like a, a run of shows, is there anything that you like to do to help with the healing process to make sure that you're, you know, that you're maintaining that vocal health? Yeah, the first thing is to, to not talk. If you can try to get away the next day just not talking, definitely do that. I also have a little steamer 
slash humidifier. It's a little handheld thing. I think you can get it at Walmart or Target or whatever. Um, it basically, it's just a little device that you hold to your nose and your mouth and steam comes out of it. And then you just breathe in the steam. And that's a really good way to kind of lubricate the vocal cords um, because water, you know, it has to go through your system before it can actually get your vocal cords moisture. Sure. I yeah. also use a throat coat tea. Um, and that's another, you can get that pretty much anywhere. Um, it's a really good, it's an all natural tea and it's really great for the vocal cords. I mean, one sip of it and you can already feel it working. So those are some things that I do. Make sure to drink tons of water throughout the show and, you know, this little things. Yeah, I definitely use all of those in the studio. And in fact, I'll link to a couple of these items in the show notes section. In addition to the throat coat tea, one of the things that I like using is uh, loquat syrup, which is kind of a Chinese medicine that mm -hmm. deals with sore throats, but it's amazing in the studio. And, I'll have to check that stage. out. What's it called? It's called loquat syrup. I'll send you a link. And it, okay, it's cool. just really, uh, you know, it tastes all right. It's kind of minty, but it's very thick yeah. and it, it just kind of coats your whole throat. So everybody in my band swears by it. And so we all kind of have our own bottle of it when we're on tour and it's been, been a lifesaver. Cool. You know, one of the things that I also wanted to kind of mention here is that as you're looking at the diversity events, in addition to the you know, restaurants and venues that you're playing, you also do a number of charitable events as well. Like you're tied in with a larger kind of thing, either playing fundraisers or kind of uh, awareness events. Can you talk to us a yeah. little bit more about like why you decided to incorporate that into your show schedule? Well, um, I just think it's really important. I mean, there, there's music has is really powerful. I mean, you can you can like like for example, on, on September second, there's a back to school benefit that's going on in my community, and it's basically just all the local musicians getting together and raising money. You know what I mean? So, and there's there's people bringing in different school supplies and food and it's basically just a big, it's a big charity event to kind of support the kids that maybe can't afford certain things. Back to school time can be really stressful for many different reasons. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually a substitute teacher as well, in addition to being a musician. And I do see a lot of kids that do struggle, you know, a lot of them only eat when they're at school because they don't have food at home and it's really sad. So um, it's really cool when you see, venues and restaurants that are just giving back to the community and making music a part of it. There's also a festival called Tertulia, and it's a newer festival that started happening around the Tampa Bay area. Um, and it initially started as a fundraiser for a gentleman. It was a local musician who was actually killed. And it was a really kind of a traumatic event for all of us because he was really big in the, the music community. But what his bandmates ended up doing, they came out with this festival to kind of raise money for his family after his death and everything. So, and that, you know, it started as just a one-time festival thing. And now it's, you know, kind of happening every year more as an honor event, you know, like we have this event to kind of honor, not just this musician who, who passed away, but, you know, other musicians in the community who are going through a hard time or, you know, that are, just struggling. So it's just really important to give back. And it sounds like that just in the process of giving back, you're also connecting with a larger community as well. Like you're making connections, you're building relationships uh, with even with other musicians who, who care about something or passionate about a cause. Have, yeah. have, have you seen that impact your work in other kinds of ways? Like do you incorporate some of these themes into your music? I do actually. Um, I have one song it's, it's called Brave, and it's actually um, going to be the title of my new album that's going to be coming out at the end of this year. Um, I wrote it after the um, Orlando shooting at the Pulse nightclub um, back in 2016. I wrote it after that, and I, I kind of... I was wanting to really write a song about just social issues and social injustice, and that kind of got my, my mind going. And I also incorporated the Brock Turner rape case. I don't know if you remember that. It happened a few years yeah. ago. Um, yeah. So the song Brave talks about those two issues in the verses. But the bigger picture of the song is just about, you know, because there's stuff like that happens every day. You know what I mean? 
So that's kind of what the song is about. So do, doing these types of events, it's always really nice to bring out that song and kind of explain what it's about and explain the meaning of it. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think that one of the things that I always encourage people to do is that when they are doing, you know, when they want to incorporate some kind of activism or some kind of larger theme into what they're doing, by having it as part of the music and by looking for opportunities like connecting with a community organization or fundraiser, it provides a little bit more authenticity for for the audiences. They, they could see those connections and it makes them want to support you even more because they those values will help resonate within themselves. So they'll, they'll see a part of it and they'll say like, wow, this person, they're not just playing this just to you know, get in front of another audience. They're playing it because they genuinely care about this. Yeah, and if you have a platform, if you if you have a way to to reach many people at once, you know why not bring in some more serious issues? I love the fact that you incorporate stories into this as well. That you you put it right into the lyrics, and then and you're you're doing these kinds of events. It it definitely presents a holistic picture of an artist who's not only you know playing music, which is amazing as it is but also because you're deeply passionate about making a positive contribution to society in other ways and, and by speaking to these important issues. So it provides a little bit more depth. And I think that's something that audiences really kind of connect with. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of like your live performances, I also noticed uh, in some of your videos and your pictures here that you perform kind of in multiple configurations. Like you, not only do you do the solo acts as kind of a singer songwriter, but you also work with uh, you know different musicians on this. And so I'm kind of wondering what your approach is when you're going to shows and deciding you know what to use. Like do you, do you have a kind of a standard cast of musicians that you like to work with, uh, a, a normal backing band that you like to hire, or does it really kind of depend from show to show? It really depends on show to show. Usually I'm by myself because usually restaurants, you know, the people are eating, so they don't want this giant, you know, rock band in their face. So at restaurants and quieter places, they definitely would rather have just one person with their guitar singing softly. Um, But for bigger shows, I definitely always get a band together, Um, like festivals and things like that. One of them was the Suncoast Arts Festival, which is... um, kind of a it's kind of a big deal in, in our community and I, I always have a band for that show just because you know it's something energetic and pumped and and I, I love playing with other musicians you know when one of the things that happens when you're you know playing every single day like you you do meet a lot of other musicians and it's just kind of cool to build a little I don't know, a little family, I guess, of, of just a bunch of different people that I can call whenever I need them. So, but it really does depend on, on the show. It's not really always a set, a set band. And I like that because each show kind of sounds a little bit different, you know, in a good way, because each musician can bring something different to the table. So it's really important to, I guess, just branch out. You it know? also makes some create some additional variety for people who see your show because they you know they're never really sure what they might get and they might say oh wow i heard the song just acoustically last time and this time it's with a full band how do you approach your album with this do you do you use a full band for for all your tracks or do you kind of lean more towards solo kind of stuff that's actually something i i've been struggling with a little bit um the album i'm working on now i i am using a full band however it does get kind of tricky when you're playing a show and it's just you solo and someone buys your CD and then they come back to see you next time. And then they say, Oh, well, it sounded so different from, you know, your performance. Um, I haven't really heard any negative feedback from that. And I do know a rule of thumb for musicians is to try to keep the album as close to your live performances as possible. However, it is a little bit difficult for me because I do play by myself a lot. So, um, You know, for the album, I just, I definitely wanted to add a full band because that's just what I wanted. And I kind of just took the risk. I was like, well, it's not going to always sound like this when I play live, but that's okay. You know? (laughs) Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I mean, I play in a synth pop dance rock band, but 
Uh, last couple of shows have just been acoustic gigs where we tell stories and play some music. And we always kind of introduce it and say, hey, if you buy our album, if you listen to our music on Spotify or wherever it is, we normally play with a full rock band, but we're going to do something special for you. And it's like when you just introduce it or in that particular way, a lot of times people are like, oh, wow, this is, I'm getting something that other people aren't getting to experience. So it makes it a little more special. And I love acoustic albums. I mean, I, I definitely, if I see an, a, an artist that I appreciate and they release an album that's kind of an unplugged thing, I'm all about it. And I've actually thought about doing that after this CD releases. I thought about maybe creating, um, you know, just something, a smaller type of project that I can maybe give as like a bonus gift or something like that to where they can hear me the way I sound, you know, completely stripped of all of the, you know, other instruments. <laughs> Absolutely. So with all these shows, how do you like to promote them? A lot of my shows now are actually residencies. So, you know, every first Thursday I'm here, every second Thursday I'm here, every other Wednesday I'm here. So I create a lot, I create a lot of flyers that I, you know, constantly put on my social media. Um, but I basically on, you know, whatever flyer I make, I'll put, you know, oh, come see me every other Wednesday or every other Tuesday so that way, you know, people seeing this, if they can't make it out to the show that night, they know when I'll be there next. So that's pretty much how I promote. I do contact a lot of local stations for bigger shows. Um, there's some local radio stations for a show I did a few weeks ago um, that was, you know, kind of a big deal. So, you know, I'll just contact them. Luckily, the Tampa community is very welcoming. We have a lot of outlets. We have a lot of local radio stations. We have a lot of local um magazines and things that you know i mean i'm even friends with a lot of the people who who edit those i'm friends with them on facebook you know so i'll just send them a message and be like hey i have a show coming up so luckily in tampa here they you know the promoters and things like that they're they're very generous with getting the word out and helping local musicians that's so that's pretty much how i approach it yeah yeah, I've noticed, uh, I mean, I have a publicist that I work with now, but even before that, whenever I was on the road, a lot of times I would just call the local radio stations and say, hey, we're playing, do you want to give out a free, couple of free tickets to your listeners? And almost always, if there was a live DJ on air, they would say, like, yeah, we'll do it in the next hour or whatever. They'd be happy to announce it. And so I think yeah. that, you know, it kind of is this approach that I've adopted throughout my career where I like to say the answer is always no until you ask so you might as well just exactly. ask because like yeah. it doesn't really hurt to and oftentimes as you mentioned you can just become friends with people and as long as you don't take advantage of that or exploit their relationship but give them stuff that they can genuinely use because they want content for their listeners then it's a win-win for everybody involved yeah exactly and another thing that i that i try to do is not just promoting myself, but promoting other people. If I see a, a friend of mine who's doing a big show, even if I'm not a part of it, I'll, you know, share their post or let other people know, hey, my, my friend's playing this festival. It's going to be really great. You should come out. So a lot of musicians see that. So then when you have a big show coming up, they're likely to do the same thing and they're likely to come out and watch. I think that is really key because a lot of times we – kind of get into our own world and treat other acts as competition, but they're not. It, like, it's community. And the more that you can help other people with their goals, the more it'll help you because your audience will say, wow, this person really cares about the other musicians in the area. They, you know, they're introducing me to all kinds of music. They can actually see you as a source of like things to do and, and other music to check out in town. So people start, people see that and it's, really endearing instead of someone who only makes things about themselves all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's the quickest way to not reaching your goals, I think, because I mean, it's, it's cliche, but you know, it takes a village. So. Absolutely. I think the more people yeah. you can bring along the way to success, the better, because those people are going to be like a family. They're going to be a team that you can count on. And it just, you know, it's like the old adage, the rising tide lifts all boats. Like, it, everybody wins. When, when, when someone, like, coming from a particular city does really well, more people pay attention to that city. I mean, yeah. industry folks, 
all the venues do better. Like it helps everybody. It doesn't hurt for 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 your friend to be successful. Exactly, and that's another reason. Back to you know why I play with so many different types of musicians. It's also about support, and it's also about getting them work too. You know, or maybe they want to play at that venue. And they're, you know, having a hard time getting in. Well, if I can, I'll bring them on my show and say like, oh, well, you play bass. OK, well, I can use a bass player. Yeah, come on, play. You know, we'll make this a, a trio show, you know, and then that'll get that musician involved in that venue, too. And, you know, if, same thing going to see other people's shows. You might get booked at the venue that they're playing at. You know, I've had a lot of friends. I've gone to see them play and they've invited me up on stage to play a song just because I was there supporting them. And then I've gotten booked at that venue myself, you know, so. That's amazing. It's all about sharing, yeah. Sounds a lot like the culture here in Nashville. (laughs) People love to do rounds. They love to do guest appearances on each other's shows. And it really enhances the entire community. Absolutely. That's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I I love the Tampa community. I think, I think we got a good thing going on. It It sounds, it sounds wonderful. So. I want to transition and ask you a few questions that I like to ask everybody who comes on to this show. They do not necessarily have to be music related, but if they are, sure, that's great. This is more just about kind of getting that mindset of, you know, what makes you, you. So the first question is, what is the book that you've given away the most as a gift and why? Or another way of thinking about this is like, what are the one to three books that have really influenced your life in some kind of way? Definitely The Secret. I'm a big, uh, I'm really into that book. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's it's called The Secret. And there's actually a, a documentary on, I, th- I think on Netflix as well. It might still be up there. But, yeah, um, it was on Netflix. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I really do live by that book. You know, I'm all about, you know, positive thinking. Um, it's by Rhonda, I can't uh, pronounce Rhonda, her. Rhonda Byrne. Rhonda the, Byrne. Okay, she, yeah. she does The, the um, Law of Attraction. Yes, the law of attraction and basically whatever you believe out there. I mean, it, it's I, I'm not I'm not going to sit here and, you know, say for, you know, yes, this has changed my life. But I think it's important for everyone to have that state of mind. You know, I I, I mean, do I get discouraged sometimes? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. But the secret is definitely a book that I always go back to every few months. You know, I'll just kind of sit there and, and read through it. You know, I. I don't always read it cover to cover, but it's definitely something that I like to go back and just kind of remind myself, like, look, it's, it's the second I start getting discouraged is the second that I start, you know, not getting to where I want to be. You know what I mean? Sure. And so so for, for folks who are not familiar with the secret or the law of attraction, it's basically speaks about a certain pattern of thinking. Like it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you only think negative thoughts, then more negative things are going to happen to you. But if you yeah. can visualize and focus on success and you, you, you kind of ask the universe or ask God or whatever your faith system is, uh, or even ask yourself like, you know, for something, you generally see it re- realize more often because your, your focus all of a sudden shifts. Your perspective is going to be on all of the things that lead to opportunities rather than kind of mishaps or things that affect you negatively. Yeah, absolutely. And some people kind of turn their nose up at it and think it's this big mystical thing, but it's really not. For me, It's it just helps me stay positive. You know, it, it helps me feel better, and there's nothing wrong with feeling better. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's, it's very much in line with uh, old authors who do that would be like Norman Vincent Peale, which mm-hmm. he wrote The Power of Positive Thinking, and... Uh, things like that it's like really based in just kind of psychology and as well as spirituality there's just these ideas that if you put these things in the universe if you put out a good energy and attitude you're going to get a lot more out of it than if you're just negative about every little thing right absolutely are there any other books that you really love that that you like to share (laughs) <laughs> there's one that I'm listening to now actually on my second time I, I got it on audiobook because I drive a lot so you know I'm trying to listen to it um, and it's I'm, I'm not gonna use swear words on your show but it's um, <laughs> it's by Mark Manson and it's the subtle art of not giving an F <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I don't want to 
you use swear words on your show, but um, it's I, I just started listening to. I actually finished it in like a few days, just driving around, and um, I'm on my second go around with this book, and it's by Mark Manson, and it's um. I can't really say at this point why it's like it's speaking to me so much, but it's a really it's it's kind of my calm down book. <laughs> Whenever I start getting overwhelmed and I start, you know, thinking like, oh man, am, am I doing the right thing? Am I, you know, I've been doing this for a few years and I'm not really where I want to be. Am I okay? And you know, I kind of start giving myself anxiety. So this is a really good book for calming down and realizing like, listen, you know, the things that you're worrying about really in the big picture aren't that, it's not that big of a deal. You know, you need to care about less in order to be happy, you know, care about the things that matter and just do what you love. If you love music, then you're doing the right thing. You know, as long as you're healthy and you're happy and you've got, you know, friends and family that you care about, that's what you should really be worrying about, you know, as opposed to your career, you know, because your career is going to happen, you know. It sounds similar to uh, Jen Sincero's book, You Are a Badass, which is kind of like how to stop doubting yourself and start living this, like, the life you're meant to live instead. Yeah. I haven't read Mark Manson's book yet, but are there any particular tactics or, or approaches in it that you fa- have found really useful for you for just kind of dealing with negativity? Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many. He kind of, he's really blunt throughout the book. He One of the things he talks about is, um, he says, you are not special. And what he means is he's saying everyone thinks that their problems are the only problems in the world. They think this, this, this problem is happening to me. This must be exclusive to me. This is my life. Oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? When really your next door neighbor is probably having the exact same problems, you know, maybe in a different way. But the bottom line, it's, you know, we all have problems. And um, I think the biggest takeaway from the book is I feel like people, a lot of the times they feel like they always have to be happy and they always have to, you know, be in a good mood and everything has to be going well. And if it's not, they freak out and they say, oh, this is the worst. This bad thing happened to me. I can't deal with this. When it's like, you know, you really should be seeking out those failures and those negative things because that's how you grow. If everything's perfect all the time, you're not going to grow and you're not going to learn anything. You're just going to be spoiled and entitled, you know? <laughs> so you, you need the struggles. You need the, you need to, you know, be slapped in the face a bit, you know, metaphorically speaking, obviously, but you, you need to, to fall on your face a few times if you want to grow and if you want to succeed and if you want to learn from it, you know, it's not always going to be, a success you're gonna have to really work at it so that's a really good book he doesn't really talk about music at all in it it's not really a music book but it's a good life book i think that's helping my music career that's great i mean and i love that approach because if you were to apply that to music like imagine if every song in the world was just upbeat catchy happy then you, yeah. you wouldn't have these amazing ballads that really speak to deeper other emotions or well, imagine if every single movie ever released was only a romantic comedy and you didn't have any like documentaries or dramas or yeah. horror like life would be really bland it'd be kind yeah. of terrible so it, it i think Absolutely. learning to encounter those moments and appreciate them from what they are and you know when we do make mistakes to learn from them is it is an art it, it is something that i think more artists need to to really learn especially since many of us kind of deal with this uh, identity crisis from time to time thinking like do we matter like if, when people are very critical about our art it's like it feels yeah. like it can it can really destroy your world but if, if you learn how to like take that and funnel it into something positive it, it could do some wonderful things yeah exactly yeah and that's that's pretty much the, the premise of the book and it's it's great it's a great book so speaking of those kind of negative moments have you ever had a failure or kind of an apparent failure that you later found out it helped set you up for a later success? Or do you have like a favorite failure moment? I, I think when I first started playing music, I every show I played, I mean, I was messing up left and right. I remember I used to get, because I used to only play a few times out of the month. And those few times out of the month were a big deal to me because I wasn't playing all the time. Um, I do remember one time I was I was playing at, you know, a restaurant and a, I had, my music wasn't memorized yet. So I had my music stand and I had my 
my book open with my chords and my lyrics and then a big gust of wind came and just blew it all away and I was just I remember I was mortified because there's people watching and I'm like stumbling around trying to gather my papers like oh no this is awful um but little little things like that have happened to me so many times that I realize now you know I, I, I just I don't get nervous like I used to it's crazy I i when I do things, it's like, well, I, it's almost like I've learned how to mess up gracefully. You know, I still make mistakes on stage. I do, but I know how to do it in a way that no one really notices. And if I do, and if people do notice, it, notice I just kind of shrug and say, eh, whatever, or I'll say something funny, or I'll just, you know, pretend it didn't happen. But those, though, all of those little accidents that would happen during my show all of them together definitely helped me in the long run because I feel like now I've I've had everything happen to me I've had you know speakers go out cables go out guitars go out you know I've had gusts of wind come and blow all my stuff away it's like what else could happen you know (laughs) yeah it's like you understand that the world goes on that you can still keep moving on beyond that and I, I think it's actually important for artists to try and almost try and make as many mistakes as possible and realize it's not the end of the world and you can recover from that. Or the thing that we think is like horrible and embarrassing really might not be that bad in the bigger like picture. of th- In fact, uh, one of my favorite books, The 4-Hour Workweek from Tim Ferriss, he talks about how, you know, you should can you can kind of practice doing things that are a little bit outside of your comfort zone because it helps prepare you for bigger, more dramatic moments. And one of his challenges is to have to have uh, the reader basically go go in a public place, any public place. Like maybe you're in line at the bank or uh, at in a restaurant or in a quad on a on a college campus or something. And this is especially if you can find a line where it's crowded or something and he's like just lie down lie down on the ground for like (laughs) a minute and then get up as if nothing happened and then continue waiting in line and if if people like look at you funny or they begin asking you questions like are you okay you could just say oh yeah i just just wanted to lie down for a second and then like it's like something as simple as that like a lot of people feel very very uncomfortable with that but it's like if you if you do that, it starts making you more comfortable with other kinds of situations. And another one he says is to go and try and ask somebody, try and get like ten strangers' phone numbers. Just just like say like, hey, you look like something who I would really be interested in meeting and speaking more with. And just get their number. He's like, you don't even have to call them. You could tear it up or throw it away or whatever afterwards. It's more about the thing. It's more about asking than getting it. Whether you get the, the number or whatever it is or not, it's just learning to overcome this kind of, you know, self-preservation kind of mechanism that we have in our bodies that try and prevent us from Absolutely. embarrassing situations. It's like once you do that, then all of a sudden you can kind of do anything. Yeah, we get so nervous, don't we, as humans? We get so worried about what other people think. Um, a memory that actually just came to my head of this a few years ago, but I was playing um, one of our – because the Yankees – train down here and for spring training. So um, me and uh, two other musicians and I, we got together, we, we got to play the Yankee spring training game and it was fun, but the show was a disaster because the rules that they had, we, we couldn't do a sound check um, because of, they didn't want the noise. So we, we plugged all of our stuff and our equipment wasn't that great. Cause this was a few years ago. We didn't really have the funds to invest in decent equipment yet. Um, <clears throat> so you know, our, our sound system was not the greatest. We couldn't have a sound check. And then once it was time to perform, it was just feedback and just like, and then this is the Yankee spring training game. This was such a big deal to us, you know, but the show is just, <laughs> it was a train wreck. And it, it, it was really, um, it was discouraging and I, and I was embarrassed and I was upset. But, you know, when I, I said I did um, the Tampa Bay Rays game last Sunday and I I wasn't even nervous because I was like, well, it couldn't possibly be worse than the Yankees game. So, <laughs> like, you know, it'll it'll be fine. And and it was, and it was great, you know. And we got invited back. So, yeah. That's that's awesome. 
So, you know, it's, it's so true. We can kind of bounce back from anything if we allow ourselves to. But if you dwell in that failure, it's almost like you're getting punished extra. Yep, you're, you're, you're just messing yourself up, up worse. <laughs> yeah. So, final question here. If you were to meet a smart, driven musician, someone who, who's looking at your career and wondering what they need to do as well, what would be the music business advice that you hear often that you would tell this person to ignore? Like, what are the bad recommendations that you hear often that other artists should be avoiding? I would say what a lot of artists, what a lot of people try to do is they, they, they focus too much on the business and they, they, you know, they'll take a song and say, well, this is great, but it's not really like what's on the radio right now. Um, you know, you need to have a song like this or, um, you know, release a single instead of an album. That's a big one that I go back and forth with other musicians about, because to me, I like making full albums. I, I understand that, you know, the CD market, not a lot of people are buying CDs like they used to. I understand that in the music industry, you know, a lot of artists do constantly release singles. I get that that's kind of how the business is, is working now. But for me, um, I would tell an artist to just focus on your art. If, 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 you know, if what your management team is telling you to do doesn't feel like it lines up with your values and your art, then don't do it. You know, don't focus just on the fame and the popularity. A lot of musicians I hear, they say, oh, well, this this sounds like it could be on the radio. So my goal is to get a certain amount of hits on Spotify by the end of the week. And I'm like, well, is that all you're doing it for? Like, this is just for listeners on Spotify. I mean, we you want people to listen to your music, but you should want to enjoy your music and you want to connect with your music also, you know, and you're not going to be able to please every listener. Some listeners are going to hear your music and say, oh, well, this isn't really, you know, this isn't really my style. That doesn't mean you change it, you know? Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, so realize what makes you unique. Dwell in yeah. that. And don't try and it, be like yeah. everybody else. Yeah, and, and maybe your path as a musician isn't to be the next Ariana Grande. You know what I mean? It's, it's, and that's fine. It's, it's, music's more than that. The music business and the career I think it's it's more than just popularity you know and if you're doing it just for the popularity and just for the outcome I just I don't think it's going to really work out too well for you you know awesome well Frankie thank you for joining us on music business my hacks thank you so much I had fun here's the part of the song when I wonder Thanks again for joining me for another episode of Music Business Hacks. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Frankie Ray. Tomorrow we'll be back with our monthly recap talking about the best ideas for all of August. Now, if you have a question about the music industry or perhaps you would like to be a guest on this show, please let me know. Go to musicbusinesshacks.com and hit that contact button. If you're enjoying the show, I would appreciate a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thanks again, and we'll be back again tomorrow.